Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wilson Center. The Wilson Center is a think tank that was congressionally chartered as a living memorial to the former president. And that means we are not only congressionally chartered, but we are scholarship driven and fiercely nonpartisan. It is a joy to introduce this event, focusing on the book that David Sanger and Mary Brooks have written, New Cold Wars, China's Rise, Russia's Invasion, and America's Struggle to Defend the West. Now, David, of course, hardly needs an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. You all know him as the New York Times' Washington correspondent. He's a frequent guest commentator on every serious news program and podcast out there, and probably some less than serious ones as well. He has that all-too-rare ability to see above the day-to-day -day crises that policymakers are facing. Instead, he sees patterns, and he spots tectonic shifts before they crack the surface. So a conversation with David not, may give him information, but it also gives whoever's talking to him valuable perspective. Everyone gets something to think about. Mary Brooks is a former public policy fellow here at the Wilson Center, yay. She writes on the interconnected issues of foreign policy, conflict, cybersecurity, and technology. Mary was previously a fellow in the Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Program at R Street Institute. You can read her latest work on our Wilson Center website, including the article, What America Learned from Cyber War in Ukraine Before the First Shots Were Fired, and I really recommend it. Mary is now working at the State Department, but hopefully has not become too diplomatic. <laughs> they are joined uh, by one of the Wilson Center's best of best, Dr. Robert Litvak. Rob is the Center's Senior Vice President and Director of International Security Studies, he is consultant to Los Alamos National Laboratory as well. His strategic vision and critical thinking has shaped how many of us in this room understand nonproliferation. Rob and David were on this stage together a year ago or so for a discussion of Rob's latest book on tripolar instability. So it only seems fair to give Rob the chance to quiz David for a change. Now, here's a secret. David and Mary worked on this book from an office on Wilson's third floor, where Rob and I were their neighbors. <coughs> it was phenomenal to have an inside look at how they created, crafted, and built this book. It was also a rollicking good time. That's just one of the reasons that I can't wait for our discussion today. For our online participants, a note. You are not shut out of the question and answer. Oh no, no, you have the opportunity to participate. You can submit your questions directly under the event stream on our website, and we'll see them, and I will try to put David on the spot as much as I can for you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Robin. And welcome all of you to the Wilson Center, those of you who are with us in person, those who are with us virtually uh, participating online. Um, David and Mary, this is a really a stunning achievement. Congratulations on this fantastic new book. New Cold Wars, plural. Uh, they say that journalism is the first draft of history. Well, uh, this is the second, uh, based on deep reporting and extraordinary access that uh, you both had to top policymakers to put this story together. And David, uh, in think tank parlance, you're a recidivist. Um, this is your fourth book, uh, and the third you've written at the Wilson Center uh, in residence. Uh, the other two, uh, uh, your first book, The Inheritance, and your third, The Perfect Weapon, were written uh, in, at, while you were at the Wilson Center. Uh, but this book is different. Uh, it reaches back further in history, really to near the start of, of your reporting career. It takes us deep into the White House as they confronted Russia and China in ways no president has had to do before. So uh, let's start there. What were you hoping to accomplish with this book? Well, thanks, Rob, and thanks, uh, of course, to Robin. Um, uh, when we were working on this book, Rob only had one request, which is that whatever we did, we did our first presentation at Wilson. And I can't imagine any other place where we ever would present this book first because Wilson is, was really our intellectual home for so long. And we had, um, as Robin suggested, a really great time doing this. Sometimes the stress of it made it seem like it wasn't as much fun, 
But usually by the end of the day, we were beginning to struggle our way through a narrative that really takes you from the end of the last Cold War to the opening days of what we think are the new Cold Wars. Um, I particularly want to thank uh, Rob, who made it possible for me to come here, made it possible for uh, Mary to come as well. And Mary is, as you can tell, the indispensable partner in all of these things and added so much to it, as did Michelle Carrilla, who was in the audience. Michelle, raise your hand out here so everybody can see you. And um, uh, we had Stephen Stamis as a as a uh, intern here who had the um, unenviable job of dealing with those 75 pages of footnotes you will find at the end. You don't have to read each one. Um, and I also want to thank um, uh, Maria, who set this, this up, uh, Kyla, who sat opposite us, or was in the opposite uh, office, so she had to go hear all the arguments uh, about how we constructed paragraphs, and uh, and Mark Green for uh, for supporting this. Rob was terrific. He would come by the office every day. He was kind of. It took me a while to realize this was like doctor's rounds in the hospital, <laughs> and she, he just wanted to sort of see whether or not we were still breathing, uh, whether or not we had actually produced anything whether we had produced anything of merit or whether we were going to come in the next morning and just rip it to shreds, which happened a few mornings. So to your question, what, why did uh, I want to go do this? You, Mary and I sort of worked this, the proposal for this book out in 2020, two years before we knew that Russia would invade uh, Ukraine. The idea initially was that it would be primarily a book about the Cold War emerging with China because it didn't seem like the Russian relationship was, you know, significantly worse than it had been. As always happens when you are writing books of current history, current history comes up and bites you in the rear, and that's what happened here. But it also played immediately to our themes. What we were trying to do here, Rob, was to put the current chaos that you see, an active hot war in Ukraine, uh, a tense military confrontation over Taiwan, the South China Sea, the islands off the Philippines, Scarborough Shoal and all that, the semiconductor competition and other technology competitions, the financial competition with China, the new form of containment, which is to block exports of certain high-tech goods. We wanted to go try to put all of this in a frame so that you could understand the chaos of today. And even the Mideast, though the most recent outbreak happened just as we were uh, closing the book up, and you'll read some about it in the last chapter in the epilogue, in part, you can explain through the movement of Russia and China from a previous effort to contain Iran and its nuclear program, something that Rob has written so brilliantly about, to um, when they were working alongside the United States and Europe, to where we are today, where Iran is a major supplier to Russia and a provider of oil, of course, to China, as it has been for a long <coughs> time. But mostly what we wanted to do was to explain the outcome of a huge global shock, which was that we got the end of the Cold War and what the post-Cold War would look like almost completely wrong. That we went into it assuming that China was so invested in its economic relationship with the United States, that Russia was so dependent on its sale of gas and oil that they would never upend the apple cart by challenging the Western system and going directly against the United States and its allies. And that's what certainly the first decade after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union were all about. By the second decade, I think it's fair to say that Vladimir Putin was being pretty clear about where he was headed. He showed up at the Munich Security Conference in 2007 and basically said, there are parts of Mother Russia as envisioned by Peter the Great that need to be reunified. And you guys are not, that's not part of your plan. And we kind of ignored him. 
Bob Gates stood up and said, you know, I've been through one Cold War. We don't need another great laugh line. We waited seven years. Putin took Crimea. It took a year for the United States to put sanctions on. The next year, Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, signed the Nord Stream 2 agreement and uh, basically uh, declared that the Russians were a reliable supplier. And so it's perfectly reasonable that Putin would have come to the conclusion that if he decided to take all of Ukraine, no one was really seriously going to get in his way. And then there was China, where we misjudged Xi Jinping. All the intelligence reports, the time that Joe Biden spent with Xi when they were both vice presidents, led you to believe and led the American intelligence community to believe that he would bide his time, that he would make sure that uh, he didn't confront the United States directly. We now know from the secret speeches that ultimately got out that he started building up his nuclear force and giving the orders for that in the first months after he took office. Mm -hmm. The crackdown on Hong Kong was a good sign of where things were going. So we wanted to go explain this era, and then Mary and I decided, because it's the true repertorial thing to do, that the way to do this is get on an airplane and begin to do this around the world. And so our long absences from the third floor were when we were reporting this book. <laughs> Great. Uh, let me pick up on that, Mayor. And, you know, David just alluded to the significant amount of reporting around the world for this book. Uh, tell us what's, you know, stood out to you uh, in those interviews. Thanks, Rob. So the first thing I'll say is, like David, uh, just an enormous well of gratitude for the Wilson Center and uh, everybody who says don't adjust the mic, but I'll do it anyways. Uh, gr gratitude for the Wilson Center and everybody who really supported us and kind of encouraged us along the way. Uh, Rob's line as he would come by for his doctor's visits was, oh, are there intellectual atom bombs going off? And it was a huge boost to morale given that at that point, uh, we were usually at the point of throwing things and bickering over what the definition of a preposition was. Um, so just thank you so much for that. Uh, and then the second thing is, uh, you know, as Robin mentioned, I've now joined the State Department. So of course, the obligatory comment is that this is all in my personal capacity based on information that I learned prior to joining the government. You recited that very well. I actually yeah. did. I did. <laughs> it's the one really speech, matters. part of the speech I actually really planned for. Yeah. <laughs> Don't She's actually that. not allowed to speak to me anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Firewall. Um, so, yes, we, we did travel the world for this, and we truly circumnavigated the globe because if you've taken any flights to Asia recently, you will notice that U.S. airlines don't usually fly over Russian airspace anymore. So you have to go much closer to the equator, and it takes a very long time. And what we found as we went around the world was a lot of what I'll call nervous energy. Um, capitals are watching what is going on in Beijing. They're watching the balance of power as it shifts toward and away from Moscow. They're, they're looking at how Washington is handling this. And they're making their bets accordingly, um, or they're hedging their bets accordingly. And because they're not all interpreting the signals from these three <coughs> major power capitals the same, it has made for some truly fascinating interactions. So we went to Helsinki, we went to Finland, and we spoke with uh, the Finnish president, Sauli Ninistu, about his nearly uh, decade, uh, near, near decade long uh, series of engagements with Vladimir Putin and what he'd learned from them and how he shifted his country seemingly overnight. Uh, Finland, a country that famously did not uh, see a need to join NATO, was now joining NATO and kind of what led to that moment and what convinced them that they were going to truly step onto kind of the American National Security Alliance mm -hmm. and, and to move forward from there. Um, we, so that, you know, that's, that's a good example of someone really making their bed, so to speak, with the Americans. Uh, then we, would, we moved over to India and we got to watch, you know, the world's biggest country, the world's biggest, or from a population perspective, and the world's biggest democracy um, interacting with, Russia, with whom it has some very important economic and security relationships, uh, fighting with the Chinese diplomats about which, you know, they're all, all of the conflicts on the border, um, and then squabbling and, and, you know, kind of pushing back as, as the U.S. and India squabble back and forth about really what does it mean to um, support 
uh, you know, democratic objectives or democratic goals in the modern era. And we finished it up with uh, a trip to Taiwan and, and to go to uh, TSMC, so Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, and we got to speak with their chairman, Mark Liu, about this business model that TSMC has made flourish over the years to sell to both the Americans and the Chinese and to create this semiconductor um, manufacturing dominance around the world. And, and to ask them, you know, very pointedly, how long do you think this will be able to continue? How long will you be able to sell to both East and West? How long will the business model that not only TSMC but Taiwan has made a name on uh, developing seems pretty precarious? And so, you know, as we traveled, it was it was really interesting to see that balance of power shifting, the discussions that were being had, and kind of the ongoing. Um, decision-making calculus between all these countries around the world about who's currently in the lead, who do we suspect will be kind of in a show of power later on. Yeah, I think what's really impressive about this book is that it's, it's not just reported out of Washington. I mean, you know, you had incredible access to the high policy, you know, makers and, and you know, through um, in-depth interviews, but you really took it on the road and you sort of reported it from the world as well. So what stood out to you, David? And I mean, You've been doing Washington a lot, but I mean, you've been on a lot of planes yeah. traveling with secretaries of state and others. But this time, you sort of were the two of you were going off, not on a USG, uh, you know, aircraft as part of a press pool. This was your own project, and you had different kind of access than you would have had if you were just part, uh, accompanying an official kind sure. of visit. So, what, what, how, how, how did that play out for you? So, one of the great dangers of covering the world from Washington is, you know, you get on a plane with the Secretary of State and you get on a plane with the President or whatever, and it seems really glamorous in the movies. It's not. The seats in the back of Air Force One are <laughs> considerably worse than the seats in the front. Um, but most importantly, you're someplace on the ground for 24 or 48 hours. You're there just long enough to be dangerous, basically, because you're getting spun by whoever it is, you know, in, you're in the landing run. So what Mary and I took the time to do was actually spend the time reporting. And so we did in Finland, for example, spend the time with the president who lives quite nicely. If any of you ever get the opportunity to be president of Finland, uh, go for the residence. Uh, the, the sea comes right up to the windows and so forth. But hearing his story about how you turn a country around that you had basically conditioned over 30 years, really over since the end of World War II, not to take sides when you've got the Russians right on your border, and how he planted the seeds and then made them grow to enter NATO um, was really fascinating. <laughs> to get to TSMC, as Mary suggested, and try to grapple with the question of, is there a silicon shield? Which is to say the TSMC, which manufactures um, the most advanced semiconductors, 95% of the most advanced semiconductors in the world, all out of a series of facilities that are 100 miles off the Chinese coast on an island that Xi Jinping has publicly declared um, he had to be ready to take over by 2027, which is not all that far away. It doesn't mean he's going to do it by 2027. And the question is, does the existence of TSMC create enough protection, because China needs them as much as we do, that you could create <coughs> deterrence merely by the fact that TSMC is there? And it was interesting to hear Mark Liu, the chairman, he's retiring, I think, uh, later on this, uh, this spring, um, say to us, look, if things get really threatening, all the Chinese are going to be left with is a series of buildings here, because his engineers are clearly the highest paid people in Taiwan. In fact, there's a huge pay gap now uh, between uh, the people who work at TSMC and everybody else who works in ordinary Taiwanese industry. And they'll just pick up and leave and get their jobs in, that start in San Jose <coughs> the next Monday. <coughs> so the question is, how long does this shield remain in effect? And I think we came away with the thought, it's there for a few years until 
China learns how to go produce three nanometer or less chips. That's the diameter of the circuitry. And so then all of a sudden, the US policy of denying them the semiconductors and the equipment all falls into place because it's an effort to buy time. Mm -hmm. And you know, just as in every nuclear thing that you and I have written about, Rob, you know, <clears throat> basically the non non-proliferation strategy of the United States with Iran, with North Korea has been buy as much time as you can and hope it gets better. And that's essentially what we're doing in the technology sphere as well. And then to go to India and have the Indian foreign minister tell us, um, gee, it's really interesting. You guys really get concerned about sovereignty when uh, it happens to be one of your European allies. But where are you worrying about it when we're in a territorial dispute with the Pakistanis? So there's a chapter in the book called Don't Make Us Choose, which is basically don't make us choose between a Western world of China, Russia, Iran, what the Iranians call the axis of resistance, and a world that is American dominated. And yet if you read the story that we had yesterday about Microsoft's investment in the UAE in a company that's major in AI, there was Gina Raimondo, who was also a fascinating interview that Michelle and I went off to go do, saying, in the world of emerging technology, you can be in the American camp or you can be in the Chinese camp. You cannot be in both. Let me just you know, f uh, pur pursue that point by talking to you both about the title of the book, New Cold Wars, plural. Okay, that was a decision uh, President Biden has kind of rejected that term, but linked to you know, the old Cold War, we thought of, we use terms like, you know, when you guys, you teach, you studied at the Kennedy School, places like that, they talk about bipolarity, we lived in a bipolar world. Uh, David, you referred to the axis of resistance. Kind of a t t linked question, which is like, it, you know, you, you, you're you all in, Amazon uh, number 75, by the way, folks, if you're interested in purchasing this book, it's wonderful. Um, a new Cold Wars as a kind of a rubric for uh, uh, for the book, and you make the case why that's appropriate. But linked to that, you know, does that reflect the character of the international system now? Sure. I mean, is is it, we're, we may be in new cold wars with Russia and China, um, and there's been some collaboration between them. But is there actually does it in some ways dis define the system? Does is this axis of resistance uh, versus Western democracies? Is that kind of a a a, a reboot of of bipolarity? It, it defines the new world reality, and I'm going to um, let Mary answer this in a second because she was the one who came up with the insight that this had to be an S at the end of war. Mm -hmm. you know? um, it's one of the many reasons you keep Mary around doing this. The other, thing, the other reason is that she says, if you get too many phone calls from the New York Times, no, 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 you have to sit down and write, and you're not getting dinner until this is done. So... <laughs> um, so um, the old Cold War was primarily a military competition between two powers, and primarily a nuclear one. Um, we knew who was running the other side. We could name the people with launch authority there, right? There was something of a simplicity and a predictability to it for all of its horrors. The new Cold Wars aren't anything like that. Because there is a Russia-China relationship, that is, it runs through this book and is at the core of the mystery of what this new age is, is like. Um, that enters all kinds of new factors. Do you design your nuclear policy for the possibility that China and Russia could coordinate their nuclear threats to you? Or do you treat them as we have treated them until now as individual threats? What happens if the technology that is in China goes to Russia? And the oil and gas that's embargoed by the West in Russia goes to China. What happens when you enter a new factor in it like Iran? And it forces a flipping of the sides, as I suggested. So everything about the new Cold Wars is not only more complex, but significantly more unpredictable. We don't have as good an ability as we had 40 years ago to say if we do X, the result is almost certainly going to be Y. 
Mm-hmm. And we usually got that right. We made some spectacular errors um, along the way. But now our batting average for understanding how the dynamic is going to change is really poor. And you see that in President Biden's national security strategy, which said, we are at the end of the post-Cold War era, but we can't tell you what this new era is like. And we wrote the book to try to begin to, to go mm-hmm. do, do that. Great Mary, why, why did you put that S at the end? That was your fault. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to talk a little bit about kind of the process behind building a building a book, because it, it truly is something you construct over time. We, we really did go back and forth um, over this title. And actually, when we were first developing the proposal, it was back in 2020, and we were talking about the relationship between the US and China. Um, the book shifted substantially, perhaps not in the big picture, but in the issues that we focused on with the invasion of, of Ukraine in 2022. And so we did a fair bit of research. Uh, we are certainly not the first to refer to new Cold Wars. You can go onto Wikipedia. There is a long and storied history of generally American um, politicals <coughs> and academics calling something the new Cold War. One of the most interesting was uh, George Bush in 2002 uh, referring to his engagements with Al Qaeda at the time. So doesn't really seem to fit some of them. Some of them, it does seem to fit. In this case, New Cold Wars, with an S, is designed to bring two things across. One is that this isn't a relationship or this isn't a dynamic between the U.S. and Russia-China. It's a dynamic between the U.S. and Russia, the U.S. and China, and Russia and China. And they all have different elements and they all bring kind of introduce different dynamic um, peculiarities, if you will, into the relationship. And the second reason that I think the S is important is because when we think about the Cold War, we think about one very specific point in time. We think about the post-World War II, pre-fall of the Berlin Wall era. And our understanding of history shifts. It evolves. If you go onto the mall, there's a monument to the Great War, uh, which was a reference to World War I that is now called World War I because now there is World War II, and we can draw back on that. So when we talk about new Cold Wars, it's this is a phenomena, I think, a Cold War. I think it's perhaps more of a, of a period of military, political, ideological tensions between major powers in a nuclear age. Um, and you can argue with that or disagree, but, but really what Cold Wars was designed to say here is while this, isn't, while this perhaps isn't new, it's certainly not the same thing that we saw before. This is more difficult. It's more volatile. It's more challenging. And if we believe that we can look back at what happened in the post-World War II era and say, okay, well, this is going to end when our competitors collapse, I think we're in for a lot of hurt. Yeah. Well put. Um, David, you, you began, I mean, the starting point of the book was, I think, the insight that there were missed assumptions about Russia and China going in, um, that uh, China would peacefully integrate into the global economy and uh, that would go smoothly, that Russia was reliant on its integration into the Western economies through energy, and uh, um, that didn't play out. I mean, the, the optimism of the 90s. When, you know, at what point would you say it was evident to American policymakers that things were going off track and uh, that the reality wasn't aligning with with the theory. And I I will unfairly add to that uh, because uh, we're at the Wilson Center where uh, we have a lot of historians and they engage in counterfactuals. Where it went off the rails and is there any counterfactual kind of history in which it could have gotten right if only we had done different things. There's a whole school of NATO expansion that right. you know, exacerbated the Russians. I mean, where do you stand on the counterfactuals that if we'd played our hand in the West differently, that, that we wouldn't be, you wouldn't have had to write this kind of book? Well, you're asking this in the right place. Of course, Wilson is the home of the Cold War Studies Center and, uh, and the, um, the documents from that are enormously helpful, including on the question you asked. But let me start with your first one. Where did it go off the rails? It didn't, so first of all, my first assumption is we had to give this a shot. 
we had to try out the possibility that these countries, for the reasons we suspected, were willing to go join on to Western institutions and that the Western institutions would change them more than they would change it. And that was the bet of letting China into the WTO. Oh, don't worry, I've, I covered this and the vote and the sales pitch in Congress was once they are in and under the rules, it will give them the political excuse to go sign up to our trade uh, rules. It will give them the reason that they have to abide by the rulings of uh, the WTO's courts. Well, that's not how it worked out. Instead, they went into the institution and began to change it in significant ways. At some point, you have to go compare your theory of the case to the wishful thinking that may go on in which you're excusing each piece of activity. And that's, I think, where it went off the rails. So if we had listened to Putin in 07, we might have handled this differently, including maybe not expanding NATO as far as we went. Certainly there were cold warriors, old cold warriors, like George Cannon, that were warning against it. My own personal view is that that would not have made a difference for Putin's decision to go into Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That, you know, Ukraine obviously did not become a member of NATO, and you could easily argue the other side, had they been brought into NATO, maybe Putin would have hesitated. But, of course, we would have been thrown in the midst of the, of the war. There's a scene in the book. It's the only scene I can think of in the book where someone is drunk and we knew about it. Um, but uh, it involves a CIA station chief at the time who's invited to the end of the uh, year holiday party. And so all the declared members of the CIA station in Moscow uh, go out and a few undeclared ones to this party. And there are all these FSB and SFR members there. And one of the old timers goes up to the station chief and puts his arm around him. And he's had more than a few too many. And he says to him, you know, you're doing what I was doing. And we were working against each other. But now we're buddies and we're all working together. This is, you know, the time when the Russians are taking the pursuit of terrorism to excuse what they were doing to the Chechens and so forth. And a younger officer comes up and looks at him, a Russian officer, and says, basically, you disgust me. You guys ran the country into the ground. Now you're signing up with the Americans. You're giving all of this away. This was all taking place in the middle. It was supposed to be a holiday party, right? Um, and um, it was just this telling moment Mm -hmm. for the station chief who you'll see quoted, he tells the story inside the, the book. So how much does that permeate up into the U.S. government? I don't know. I mean, you know, lots of CIA analysts write lots of things that never make it out of the headquarters, right? Um, there were moments, including during the Iran negotiations, where we wanted to seize on the idea that Russia's participation, and they were very helpful, indicated that when we really had common interests, we could get along together. Mm. Obama did a climate deal with Xi Jinping. He was supposed to say, see, on an existential threat to both of us, the two wor world's two biggest emitters could get together. And yet we are where we are. Mm. And um, I think you describe a scene uh, in Putin's office that, you know, he doesn't have Lenin. He's got uh, Peter the Great there. That's right. Which is really... Which His is basic the, view the tell. was that, the, that yeah. the, Soviet, the old Soviet leaders were idiots yeah. who gave way too much power to okay. the outside yeah, of the Mary, Mary, build on David's comment. Oh, I'll, I'll keep this short, but we interviewed um, top national security officials across five presidential administrations. And so this was a very cool opportunity to ask people, what did you get wrong? What did you mess up? Why do you think you did it? Uh, what do you think you got right, and you know what was the alternative? Mm -hmm. And you know, two of one, you know, every single one of them would say, "Well, what would you have rather us done? Would you rather have us not tried to engage the Russians, not engage the Chinese?" And and to some extent, you know, this is a um, you don't you don't it doesn't have to be a dichotomy. You know, there was possibly a different route, but to be able to go back and and look at the decisions that were made in the '90s and say, okay, maybe you know, if we had done it differently, and, and we in this case is the people that that made the decision, it might have turned out differently. 
but how much control did we really have? And ultimately, that's why I think it's the epigram of the first chapter, is um, now CIA director Bill Burns saying, mm. who lost Russia? No one lost Russia. It wasn't ours to lose. And so the sub-theme of this book truly, for me, was the limits of American power, even in the midst of kind of a, a hegemonic hyper-power uh, hyper era. Um, and the question it, I think, should engender to everybody else is, OK, this is a book about failed assumptions. In 10 years, what's the book that we're going to write about our failed assumptions now? And can we get mm -hmm. ahead of those? Well, I'm going to jump to the here and now because it's, you know, so here we are. And we have, we're in two Cold Wars, plural. And um, I think in public discourse, you hear phrases like, this is the most fraught moment since the Cuban Missile Crisis. And um, uh, with both Russia, with the hot war in Ukraine and Taiwan with, 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 with China, talk about um, pathways you know, of uh, how we could, through in, inadvertence or through kind of instrumental calculation by Russia or China, find ourselves in a conflict, uh, a great power conflict, you know, with escalatory drivers that are different than the, 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 the original Cold War. I mean, you've written, David, about, you know, the new domains of cyberspace and outer space. I take it, and you can elaborate on this, you know, the escalatory pathways are not going to be our father's escalatory pathways. It's going to be in these new domains. You've written so much about it. Mary's got a brilliant new piece out on cybersecurity through the Wilson Center. Talk about competing in new domains where the stakes are not peripheral, like it's not a war in Vietnam, which was of peripheral interest to the United States. It wasn't, we weren't going to go to a nuclear war over it. But now the stakes are vital. It's Ukraine and Russia, which is the, you know, really of the future of Europe, and it's Taiwan and Northeast Asia. So that's a mix that's novel sure. here, and you've written brilliantly about it. So just share it with you, those of us here today. And so um, one of the characteristics of the Ukraine war is we actually saw a nuclear state threaten the use of a nuclear weapon repeatedly against a non-nuclear state. I don't think, Rob, I can recall a time when that had really happened in an act of war in the nuclear age. Um, the peak of this comes in October of 2022. And it's pretty remarkable that most Americans were kind of tuned out to what was happening here. But there's a scene in the book when uh, President Biden shows up in New York at the um, very nice townhouse of James Murdoch, the sort of black sheep of the Murdoch family. He's a Democrat. Uh, he was raising money for, for Biden. And, you know, Biden comes in and everybody's walking around looking at, at Murdoch's art collection and looking forward to the weekend in the Hamptons when they can say, oh, yes, when I had cocktails with the president earlier this week. Um, and instead, Biden is clearly agitated about something. And he says, you know, for the first time since the Cuban Missile Crisis, which had, was about 60 years ago that week, um, we're facing the very real possibility of nuclear use in Ukraine. And he wasn't talking about like some point in the future. He was talking about in the next couple of weeks. And the reason that he was talking about it in the next couple of weeks was that they had picked up intelligence from a, uh, a Russian uh, set of commanders who were responsible for moving nuclear weapons around, tactical weapons around the battlefield that were interpreted by the U.S. intelligence community to be evidence that they were actually thinking about using a nuke. And this was at a time mm -hmm. when the Russians were doing poorly in the war. And when Mark Milley would show up in the Situation Room, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he would talk about the nuclear paradox, which was the paradox that the worse the Russians did, and thus the more we were celebrating Ukrainian victory, the higher the chances of nuclear use. And they assessed internally it was sort of 50-50 at that moment. Um, I remember calling a senior administration official and saying, the pres this is late at night, the president just stood in James Murdoch's living room and started talking about the possible use of a nuclear weapon. And he was like, oh, that's what we were talking about in the Oval this morning. <laughs> you know? So um, so it was interesting that he was doing it. You always want to hear Biden listen to him at, at, at fundraisers. Um, so what did this tell us? 
he was trying to manage a real burning nuclear crisis that most Americans didn't know was underway. And they were running war games in which the question was, if they detonate a nuclear weapon in Ukraine, the old models of mad, mutually assured destruction, they don't apply. It's not like he's threatening to take out New York. So does the United States use a nuclear weapon in response? No, that got taken off the table pretty quickly. How do you respond then if one country breaks the taboo that no nuclear weapon has been used since we did it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? What's the right level of penalty? Suddenly, all these phone calls start between Austin, Secretary Austin and his counterpart, Jake Sullivan and his counterpart, Milley and his counterpart. They call the Chinese and the Indians and get them to go make statements saying there's no excuse for nuclear use in Ukraine in the hopes that they would have more influence. But you have the sense from reading this chapter that people are pulling on the levers but they no longer know what they're connected to. Mm. That's 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 well put, Mary. Your dad. Just a quick, oh, on very pathways small, of escalation. Yeah, very or? small um, kind mm. of point to this is this book and the discussion of a Cold War. It's only cold for some people, right? It's cold for us. It's cold for Washington. So this is a very you know Washington centric book and. I think you know the question of escalation becomes okay. When is it enough to draw us in? as us being the U.S. and directly impact our interests. And nuclear, that's, that's one way to do it. Um, but in the meantime, this might be a very, very miserable period of time for a lot of people that are not based here. Let me just ask you to, uh, to use the uh, kind of appropriate kind of metaphor. Can you hyperlink to your um, cybersecurity paper and just give us a flavor of what that was about? Because I think it very much captures the new era we're in the U.S., you know, the, the reporting that you and, and David did on U.S.-Ukrainian cyber cooperation, you know, like the role of the private sector as sort of a, an alerting government of when stuff was happening. It's really fascinating, but it sort of gives them a flavor of how, I mean, David used, ended with, like, the levers aren't the same, but, mm -hmm. like, who we look to in these crises, uh, you know, the players, it's changed as well. Yeah, so the, the Wilson Center very graciously uh, sponsored and recently posted, I think it's published as of last week, uh, a extended analysis um, about what the United States learned from <clears throat> uh, cyber assistance programs to Ukraine before the 2022 invasion. So it looks at the kind of interwar period between 2014 when there was the invasion of Crimea by the Russians and then kind of looks at what did the U.S. do, both from the private and public sector, to support Ukrainian efforts, um, to harden their infrastructure, to strengthen their networks, to make sure that their command and control wouldn't go down if there was, um, you know, a crisis. And, you know, what, what we really, you know, I won't spoil it. Go read it. It's free. You don't even have to buy it. Um, it's easier that way. Um, you know, and, and what, what really comes from that is that there are, are a tremendous amount of people in the US government and people in the private sector that very much cared deeply about what was going on in, in Ukraine and, and just really wanted to support, uh, whether from a geopolitical perspective, a technical perspective, um, a Las Vegas rules of cybersecurity perspective, like what happens in Ukraine doesn't stay there. Everyone remembered not Petya, which was when um, a massive Russian um, ransomware incident that turned out to not be ransomware decimated a large part of Eastern Europe. And so these efforts were designed to help keep Ukraine online. Um, but, but no one really envisioned a war, and so much of it was focused on you know, kind of the longer term capacity building, longer term commercial connectivity. And so once, um, once it looked like war was imminent, it really, that pace of support picked up. Um, and so this is really just kind of a survey piece showing what was done, uh, what the goal was, and kind of what we learned. And it's that in this new era, it's not enough to just have secure networks. You have to have redundancies. You have to build in um, security that cannot be taken out by a kinetic strike. You know, it's, it's great if you have a secure network, but if I can bomb it with, you know, a drone that cost me $5,000 to make, well, then you don't have a network anymore. Um, so, and then but also it, it really drove home the value add of, of the private sector um, and kind of how it's been working with the U.S. government and how the U.S. government has really kind of taken advantage of their capabilities to rush aid in when it really, really became important. 
Um, and so to see those incredible efforts when something went wrong uh, to, to move in people and technical capabilities and tooling. Um, so that's, that's the piece in a nutshell. It's maybe longer than it should be, but give it a chance. Super. Okay, now we're going to open it up for comments, uh, ideally questions from the floor, um, and then we'll take a few. Robin will clue me in on what's going on online, and uh, the gentleman there. People got to please identify yes, themselves. And yes, sir. My name is Scott McAbee, Institute for National Policy Research. David, this question is for you. I watched your show the other night on John Daly, uh, John Daly Stewart show, uh, John Stewart Daly show. Um, do you think that the U.S. can funnel weapons to Israel, what looks like a potential war with Iran, keep sending weapons to Ukraine, and if China attacks Taiwan, win a war in the Indo-Pacific? It seems to me the Chinese opportunity for an invasion in Taiwan just moved up a little bit uh, with, the, with what's going on between uh, Israel and Iran, and I also wrote a book in 2018 entitled The New Cold War Between China and the United States of America. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say that I did the John Stewart show to get me ready to handle Rob. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, which, uh, which one is the comedian in this equation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're paid about the same. Wilson Center and, yeah, and Comedy absolutely. Central. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so um, a really good question. So one of the characteristics of being a superpower is um, you don't get to choose that you're only going to be a, uh, you're going you're gonna to pick your fights all that easily. There are some things you're going to walk away from, but the fact of the matter is that Joe Biden came in determined to get the United States out of its fixation with the Middle East and focus finally on the pivot to China. And there's a really good book that uh, Richard Fontaine and, and Bob Blackwell have coming out in a few months about why it is that we've tried the pivot to, toward the Indo-Pacific so many times in the past 15 years and never seem to be able to execute a full pivot? Part of the answer is months like the last six months, right? Where the U.S. could just say, not our problem, but imagine what last Saturday night would have looked like if the U.S. said, not our problem, right? So you don't get to make that choice. You've actually got, if you're going to do this in a way where you're not going to let giant vacuums fill that someone else is going to fill up, and it's probably going to be somebody who lives in Beijing, um, maybe somebody who lives in Moscow, you've actually got to be able to play across the board. And that's what we're seeing the resistance to, strangely, largely in the Republican Party, but not only in the Republican Party, because there's a group on the progressive side of the, the Democratic Party that wants to make sure that we condition all aid to uh, Israel so that it's clear that they can't be using 2,000-pound bombs in, um, uh, in Gaza at the moment that we're also trying to get them to open up food aid and, and medical aid into Gaza. And the contradiction of the U.S. being both arms supplier and humanitarian provider at the same time is like more cognitive dissonance than even Washington can stand. And that's a really legitimate question, I think, that comes up out of the congressional authorization bill. But the other side of this is to basically make the argument, oh, we've tried in Ukraine, and the Ukrainians aren't up to it. You're clearly seeing the war turn now. So haven't we invested enough in this? And that gets to a question of your worldview about Ukraine. Are we defending Ukraine because they're a future member of NATO and a burgeoning democracy, if an imperfect and corrupt one? Or are we defending Ukraine because if Putin takes Ukraine, nobody thinks he's going to stop there? In other words, are we running the risk of reproducing the mistakes we made in the 1930s? Uh, Robin has a question from the, the online. So I'm representing your online questioners here. We, and there were several that have focused in on what next. So one said, oh, aren't we really in the period in the 1930s, rising Japan, rising Germany? Is that the parallel? But then another questioner said, right, what are the main top three, top five areas and things the West must address to prevail in the new Cold Wars? And well, that, uh, I think that also gives an sure. opportunity for the post-November prediction. 
It's not really a rising Japan, rising uh, Germany situation because we have a rising state that has, for the first time, hit the economic blocks. And that gets to your question about uh, is there a shorter timeline on Taiwan now? I actually think there's a longer timeline on Taiwan, but it doesn't have to do with the Middle East. It has to do with China's own economic slowdown. And Russia is not a rising state. Russia is a decaying but disruptive state that believes its preservation, or at least Putin believes, its preservation of power comes from this power projection in the most old-fashioned way at a moment that much of the rest of the society and the economy is not, not developing as well. That then takes you to sort of your next order question, which is, um, can the United States... Um, learn four or five things that they could do that would um, alter the balance here. As I suggested before, because we're in new territory, there's nothing where your action is going to have a predictable outcome. We are complementary in the book of Biden's move to go develop the American semiconductor industry to protect AI inventions, to protect chip designs. There are a lot of people who are concerned that it is industrial policy. And to those people, I'd say to them, yes, it is industrial policy. But we had a series of small business decisions. I should say a series of small decisions made by large businesses to get out of key technology manufacturing. And every one of those decisions, if you looked at them in microcosm, was perfectly justifiable lower cost to get the Chinese or the Taiwanese or somebody to go produce them, probably higher quality and so forth. But when you added them all together, you had created a national security crisis because we were no longer able to produce the core technologies we needed for our defense applications, for future technology like AI. And, you know, if you look at Biden's um, own projection, it's that if you stay on course, by 2030, we will be producing 20% of the most advanced semiconductors that we need. Well, that means that by 2030, we're still dependent on largely adversaries or vulnerable allies for the other 80%. There's a great example. Um, uh, space launch vehicles in the 1990s after the shuttle you know, yep. crashed. We were, we were launching our satellites on, we relied on the Chinese to lift them into, into low Earth orbit. And I mean, to this day, we rely on Russian engines. Yeah, Mary, yeah. Two points on what the U.S. can kind of focus on and to continue your, your tech, um, tech security point. One of the things that I found truly fascinating in researching this book and, and reporting it was the points of continuity between the end of the Obama administration the Trump administration and the Biden administration on the need to secure um, American technological capabilities and to move ahead more quickly than American adversaries. And so, um, you know, as you go through, you notice that efforts to, for example, uh, onshore to the U.S. the production of semiconductors uh, by installing uh, TSMC fabs in mm -hmm. Arizona started in the Trump administration. Discussions began in the end of the Obama administration. When you look at the uh, chips and science funding effort that took a lot of effort to get across the finish line in the Biden administration, it was discussed in the Trump administration and, and really seeded there. When you look at efforts to constrain um, the sale or the export of American and American, you know, kind of affiliated uh, working products that are designed to make semiconductors and microelectronics, those also came from earlier administrations. And so I think that there is an understanding that technology and our kind of technological advantage will define American national mm -hmm. security. And it it seems to, defi uh, to, to go beyond um, politics, but I wouldn't go so far as to call it bipartisan, giving, given what we're seeing on the Hill these days. Um, and then just the, the second, and I'll make a smaller point on this, is we've got to figure out our homeland security. Um, domestic security is national security. And when you, you, know, you look around and, and you see American critical infrastructure and you see the vulnerabilities and the risks posed by um, major uh, sustained cyber threat actors, uh, state and criminal, 
abroad, you know, you have to think, are we secure when our infrastructure is not? Great. I'm looking at the hour. Uh, we've had an hour. I'm respectful of, of the time those uh, watching uh, online. And for those here at, in Washington uh, at the Wilson Center World HQ, um, we are having a reception after this, and there are also going to be kind of books available for purchase and signing by the author. So please join me in thanking David and Mary for really an excellent presentation on the book. Thank you, Robin.